Good afternoon, um, and thank you for uh, <coughs> continuing to be a little patient with us as we're working through to adjust to this new setup. Um, we really want to be sure we're keeping everybody safe and walking the walk of social distancing. So thank you, and we appreciate your patience. My name is Dr. Uh, Betsy Tilson. I serve as a state health director and chief medical officer for the Department of Health and Human Services. And with me is Director Mike Sprayberry, Director of Emergency Management for North Carolina. Before we take some questions, I will give a little bit of an update on what people should do if they feel sick. And then Director Sprayberry will discuss supplies. And then we should be able to take questions for about 15 minutes or so. So the CDC is now recommending that people who think that they may have COVID-19 and have mild symptoms should stay home, separate themselves from others, and call their doctor for medical advice. We have a new fact sheet to help North Carolinians know what to do if they are sick. It's on our website and our communications team can make sure that you get a copy. It helps people understand that when someone with mild illness leaves their home to get tested, they could expose themselves to COVID-19 if they don't already have the infection. And if they do have an infection with COVID-19, they could give it to somebody else, including somebody in their community at higher risk for complications, or a healthcare provider who will be needed to care for people with more severe illness. And remember, a test will not change what someone with mild symptoms will do. The vast majority will recover at home. Testing is most important for people who are seriously ill in the hospital, in a high-risk setting, like a long-term care facility or a nursing home, and for healthcare workers and other first responders who are caring for those with more serious infections with COVID-19. This is particularly important as we face a na nationwide shortage of personal protective equipment. We need to be mindful so that our healthcare providers have the supplies they need to care for people who need medical attention. Your doctor can help you determine what's the best course of action for you. I've talked to many doctors across the state and they've been heroic in standing up a variety of ways to increase access to safe care for their patients, including telephone, accessibility, video, FaceTiming. And I'm so grateful for our medical providers for being so adaptable and always putting the, the safety of their patients first. And remember, for most people with COVID-19 infections, it will cause mild illness, and the safest thing for them is to stay at home. However, we do know it can make some people very ill. So while anyone can call their doctors if they're concerned about their symptoms, this is especially important for people at higher risk for more serious illness. According to the CDC, this includes people who are 65 years of age and older, or have a high-risk condition such as a chronic lung disease, asthma, heart disease with complications, compromised immune system, severe obesity, or other especially poorly controlled underlying medical conditions like diabetes or kidney problems. And since we know pregnant women are at higher risk for severe illness from other viruses, they should be vigilant. However, as of the data that we have now specific to COVID-19, we have not seen a specific increased risk for COVID-19 in pregnant women. And while children are generally at lower risk for severe infection, some studies now are coming out that maybe they're a higher risk, especially for our infants. Anyone with more serious or worsening symptoms should call their doctor or 911 right away. Those symptoms would include worsening shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, chest pain or pressure, confusion, or blue lips. And again, while most people who have mild illness will recover at home, and then they can go back to their normal activities when they can answer yes to all three of these questions. Has it been seven days since you first had symptoms? Have you been without fever for three days without any medicines for fever? And are, you, are your other symptoms improved? Once you can say yes to all that, then you can go back into your life. Thank you, and I'll turn it over now to Director Sprayberry to give us an update on supplies, and then we'll take questions. Thank you, Dr. Tilson. Again, my name's Mike Sprayberry. I'm the director for the North Carolina Division of Emergency Management. This is day 15 of our activation at the State Emergency Operations Center for COVID-19. 48 counties also have their county emergency operations centers activated. <clears throat> 94 counties have declared states of emergency. 
This morning, we received our second allocation of personal protective equipment from the Federal Strategic uh, National Stockpile. The shipment was delivered to our warehouse on five trucks and included N95 respirators, surgical masks, face shields, surgical gowns, and gloves. A logistics team from the Air National Guard Airmen unloaded those trucks and supplies and were quickly allocated and sent out to medical facilities across the state that need those items. We received a similar shipment of supplies from the stockpile last week. Those supplies were also quickly sent out to medical providers across the state, and providers are using them up quickly. We look forward to future allocations from the Strategic National Stockpile. Governor Cooper has reiterated our state's need for more federal supplies to the President and Vice President. We also have a logistics team working hard to source as many of these items as we can get on the private market. Obtaining these critical supplies is my top priority. We greatly appreciate the donations of personal protective supplies that are coming in from corporations and individuals. If you have supplies you would like to donate, you can send an email to our Business Emergency Operations Center. That email address is beoc at ncdps.gov. Again, beoc at ncdps.gov. Our priorities for the state emergency response team include sourcing critical supplies, making sure we have the personnel and equipment needed to respond to COVID-19, helping our public health partners and hospitals prepare for large expected numbers of coronavirus patients, and sharing information with our internal and external partners. North Carolina 211 continues to help hundreds of people each day with assistance and information related to the coronavirus. By dialing 211, people can help with needs like food assistance, assistance with paying rent and utilities, support for families, or just basic information. You can also receive information from 211 by text. Just text COVIDNC, again, that's COVIDNC to 898 211 to get regular information updates via text. Thank you, and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Tilson. Thank you, Director Sprayberry, and um, we're happy to take questions now. Your conference is now in question and answer mode. Hi, my name is Danielle Battaglia. I work with the News and Observer. Um, we have been requesting demographic data that has been collected by uh, DHHS on COVID-19 patients and have not gotten a reply. I was wondering if you could um, address when we could see that data being released and if you could talk about trends that you're seeing in that data and uh, what you're learning from it. Sure, thank you for the question. As we are compiling uh, our data, we are trying to put together a dashboard that has some of those curves and trends um, to make it more um, uh, transparent for you. So uh, we can follow up offline on what uh, other data we'll be able to be putting out. But our goal is to be able to be pushing out as much data as possible, the trends out um, as much as possible. We just want to be sure that data is accurate before we're pushing that out. Hi, Dr. Tilson. This is Christy O'Connor. I'm from WBTD. Um, I was wondering, we know that people who are waiting on test results to come back should stay at home, but for all of the people that they may work with or may have been in contact with prior to them taking that test, should those people also be isolating themselves because they don't know if the person they came into contact with is positive or not, especially since it takes a few days for these results to come back. 
Thank you, that's a great question and will also come into play as we're saying people with mild illness to stay at home. On the fact sheet, you will see guidance for household contacts and close contacts of, of um, people who are ill. And yes, we are saying that a household contact or close contact should try to remain at home um, and self-monitor for their symptoms for 14 days. And that information is on that fact sheet. Hi, Talitha Vickers here with WXI 12 News. This question is uh, mainly directed to uh, Director Sprayberry. Could you just let us know more information about how these supplies are being disseminated and if our state now has enough supplies to at least protect our medical staff who are on the front lines? Many of them in the triad were just letting our station know that they do not have supplies in emergency rooms. Yes, ma'am. I think that uh, globally you'll find that there's shortages of personal protective equipment and that um, I'm not, there's no way that we can sit and tell you that uh, we have enough here in North Carolina. We are working very vigorously to order more supplies. We've made requests to the federal government for more allocations of supplies. And um, as I stated earlier, we did get a second allocation today from the Strategic National Stockpile. <clears throat> the governor has also um, reiterated with the president and the vice president that we need more supplies and equipment. Um, and like I said, we have a team that's working with private vendors to get as much as those supplies and equipment as possible. So. We don't, we know that we don't have as much as we need, but uh, we are working to get as much as we can, and that is the number one priority uh, over the next few days. Yes, hello, this is Steve Devon at the Federal Observer. Uh, my question re is regarding to the uh, website that is updated with the numbers from around the state. Uh, we've noticed several on several occasions that we've got notifications from the county and then it's taken a day or two before um, those showed up. And I know there's at least one county that says it's not going to publicly release uh, their uh, cases until they're on the website. And I was just wondering if that website could be updated um, more often. We want to be sure that our numbers are, we want to be as transparent, of course, as possible. We also want to be sure that all those numbers are accurate. And so since we're getting numbers in from a variety of sources, we're making sure that at once a day we are updating that so that those numbers are as accurate as, as possible. So every day we'll be updating those numbers. Hi, this is Chandler Morgan from WBTV. This is a two-part question, one about car inspections and the other about taxes. Is there any consideration of extending the deadline for annual vehicle inspections for owners who are trying to renew their vehicle registration? And with taxes, North Carolina has extended their fi tax filing deadline but hasn't eliminated interest charges. Why is that and will that change? This is Dr. Tilson. I don't, I don't have the information to be able to respond to that, so thank you for that question, and then we can get back to you, unless Director Sprayberry has insight into that. We've taken that down, and we will respond to you later, ma'am. Hi, this is uh, Matt with the North State Journal. Uh, two part question here. First, what models are DHHS using um, in terms of the availability and rate of need for hospital beds? And secondly, will the department release the number of negative tests, including negative tests done at private labs? So I'll answer the second one first and then the first one second. On our website, what you what you'll see, uh, we have the number of total tests. Um, that includes 
the, the positives and the negatives, including at the state lab as well as outside labs. We are not getting reporting of the negative for all the outside labs, but we're, um, we have some of them and we're continuing to try to get the negatives from all the outside labs. So that's what you see on the website. The total number, that is inclusive we of have 16 questions remaining. the state lab and outside labs as well. And we're, again, we're continuing to try to get all of the negatives across all the labs that are, um, that are testing. And then your first question, and oh, I apologize, I can't remember what your first question was. Can you repeat that one? I'm so sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, the, next, the next question then, please. Yes, doctor, this is Rick Hurl with the uh, Daily Record and Restoration News Media. The uh, Surgeon General said, came out earlier and said that this week is going to get bad and that the disease, disease is spreading. I'm sure you're familiar with his comments. What's the outlook for North Carolina this week? I think we're in that acceleration phase that we've been talking about. We always had us, uh, we're going on the, the assumption that we had community spread even before we had documentation of community spread. I can, I think you can see our numbers are going up, um, even though, and we know that we are not, um, we don't have lab documentation of, of all the infections. So I think we are in acceleration spread, which is why all of those measures that the governor has been putting into place, the social distancing, all of those community-based measures, we've been very proactive, we're continuing to be proactive because we see when the acceleration spread and so we wanna double down on everything that we can do for, that, for our state to flatten that curve. We know it's gonna go up, but we want that curve to be as less steep and as flattened as possible. Hi, this is Caroline Hicks with WBTV. Many daycare centers are continuing to charge families who are choosing not to send their children right now. Are there any guidelines on whether centers can do that and any idea when financial assistance might be headed their way? Uh, so we know that, that child care is um, essential services and a really important um, piece we have been putting out um, guidance for our child care centers on how to be able to care for their, um, for their staff and for their children safely. And we are encouraging people who are able to keep their children at home to, to stay at home. The specifics about the, the payment for their staff, we'll have to get back to you on, on those specifics. Uh, Sam Walker with OBX Today. Uh, first, for Director Sprayberry, uh, you mentioned that we're six counties in North Carolina that have not declared states of emergency. Uh, could you list those and also uh, if you have any guy information regarding why they have not? And for uh, Dr. Tilson, uh, we've got several counties that have said that they've cited privacy laws and other reasons for not releasing how many patients have been tested in their counties. Uh, could you uh, expand on that or uh, give us a reason why? Or if there's going to be more data coming out that's broken down by individual counties. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. And this is Director Sprayberry. Uh, I don't know the names of those counties off the top of my head, but I can tell you that each day as we go through this event, the numbers of counties that have declared a state of emergency has increased. And so um, I would anticipate probably that we'll see some more declared tomorrow. I will also say that it's not necessary to declare a state of emergency in order to take advantage of a um, like a, a public assistance disaster. But um, this does give local jurisdictions more authorities. And so it's something that the local jurisdiction has the authority to do themselves, and uh, we leave it to them to do it. Thank you. 
And to your question about patient privacy, obviously we always want to protect patient privacy, but also make sure we're releasing out data that's important to protecting the public health. So we need to balance that. As we are getting more and more data across the state, then we're able to share more of our data um, more publicly, and it's aggregated, and then it's, it decreases the chance of an individual being identified. But we do have laws that protect individuals, especially around communicable disease. Once we get down to a county level, especially if case counts are low, then it could become more easy to actually identify that person. Um, so we have to think about the, the privacy laws as well as the information that we need to put out to protect public's health. And that'll be different um, and, and easier to do when we can do it on a, on a broader scale, but more challenging when we get down to a, a county level. Hey, Dr. Tilson, Randall Kerr with WRL-TV. Um, now that we're reducing testing and we keep hearing about flattening the curve, I'm wondering what criteria goes into determining what the curve is, and also based on uh, any evidence, when do we expect to reach that critical mass in hospitals? I mean, right now we only have about a dozen patients in there, so I'm wondering what the longer-term outlook is. Thanks. Sure. Thank you for the question. Yeah, so let's talk about um, surveillance and really evidence-based surveillance and how can we think about understanding the spread of the disease across the state in order to be able to inform our policies and decision making. And we'll just take a step back and just say that us trying to, we already know that we're not capturing or identifying all the cases in North Carolina. I think we've talked a lot about this. There's people with very mild symptoms or no symptoms. So the, the way you to understand the spread across the state is not to try to test every Everybody. Instead, what, and what we're doing and we'll be pivoting to is using our evidence-based surveillance strategies that we use for influenza to understand the spread across the state and being able to apply that to COVID-19. And that will give us a much more evidence-based science-driven um, uh, data on the spread of the disease. And then that will help us understand, do we need to put more social distancing um, and community mitigations and strategies in place, or can we start pulling them back? So that's the pivot that we're going to be doing. And we're happy to do a deeper dive on the science of surveillance uh, later this week with our state epidemiologist, who really is an expert um, in, this, in this field. So um, we're excited about that. And then I got excited about epidemiology that I forgot the other part of your question. Um, and I'm so sorry. <laughs> Hi, this is Josh Schaefer with the News and Observer. I wonder if we have any figures on how many healthcare workers, especially hospital workers, uh, are under self quarantine, and if the state is giving any advice to healthcare workers who may be more vulnerable. Thank you for that question. We don't have specific counts of healthcare workers, but for sure, a uh, healthcare worker is one of our uh, priority populations. Um, one, they're at an increased risk of exposure, and two, if our healthcare workforce is out, then they're not available to care for people who need medical care. So that is, for sure, one of our priority pop populations. A, making sure they have the personal protective equipment that they need, and then also uh, priority in terms of testing. Healthcare workers are, are in that priority population for testing. This is Carly Brousseau from the News and Observer. Um, I guess my question is about another priority population, folks in long-term care facilities. Could you talk about, um, you know, what positive tests have arisen so far and what subsequent testing happens at each of those facilities, or I guess what should happen and perhaps what has happened? Thank you for that. And your question prompted, I remember the answer, the question from a prior person was, who, what are the priority populations for testing? And so let's go over those again. Seriously ill, in the hospital, a high-risk setting like a long-term care setting or a nursing home, 
Healthcare workers and first responders are those in the priority population for testing. Um, for your question, yes, we do. Some of our cases are in uh, congregate care settings. That, of course, is a very high risk setting. And so one of the things we'll also be prioritizing, and especially the work of our local health departments that will be doing um, uh, identifying who's positive, identifying their contacts, doing our control measures. Um, that's where our health department will be pivoting as well to make sure we're getting a handle on outbreaks in high-risk settings as well. Thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate all the questions. Um, thank you for putting up for some of the technological issues that we have. But again, we want to be sure we're walking the walk and keeping everybody safe. So thank you for all that you're doing. Um, and we'll look forward to talking with you tomorrow.